Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 50, The Surgeon. In episode 42, Rose Lodge, that was based on the Broughton family, it was mentioned that William Broughton was the assistant surgeon to John White on the First Fleet's voyage. When learning about Australian history at school, you hear about the main players, Captain Arthur Phillip and so on, but you may have occasionally heard the surgeon, John White, but I personally didn't really know a lot about him, so I was intrigued to find out more. John White was born at Dramarin, near Belcu in County Fermar in Ulster, the north province of Ireland, in about 1756. He had at least one brother, Thomas, and one sister, Jane. The White family farmed on the slopes of Belmore Mountain in the town of Dramarin during the late 1700s and early 1800s. Designed for the medical profession, he would pass an examination at Surgeons Hall, London, followed by another before the Transport Board, after which he would be qualified to receive from the Admiralty a warrant as surgeon's mate in a seagoing vessel on the Royal Navy. On the 18th of June 1778, John White qualified as a surgeon's mate, first rate. He entered the Navy on the 26th of June 1778, aged 28, as third surgeon's mate on the HMS Wasp. In the next five years, his naval service took him as far as the West Indies and India. He was promoted to surgeon in 1780 and after serving on various vessels, on the 26th of June 1786, he was appointed surgeon on the Irresistible. On October 16th, 1786, Captain Hammond recommended surgeon John White to Lord Sydney as a capable young man of an adventurous disposition, excellently qualified to take charge of the medical department of an overseas expedition such as that of the proposed settlement at Botany Bay in New Holland. And the letter writes, Sir A.S. Hammond to Under Secretary Nepean, Chatham, 16th of October, 1786. Dear Sir, Mr. White, the surgeon of the Irresistible, is a candidate for Botany Bay. He is a young man of much credit in his profession and of that sort of disposition and temper that render him a very proper person for such an establishment. If no surgeon is yet appointed and you will do me the favour to recommend him to Lord Sydney, I shall think myself much obliged to you and shall consider myself bound to government for his good behaviour. I am, etc. A.S. Hammond. Eight days after, White was appointed Surgeon General of the expedition. And Surgeon White's commission, George III, to our trusty and well-beloved John White, greeting. We do, by these presents, constitute and appoint you to be surgeon to the settlement within our territory called New South Wales. You are therefore carefully and diligently to discharge the duty of surgeon by doing and performing all and all manner of things thereunto belonging, and you are to observe and follow such orders and directions from time to time as you shall receive from our governor of our said territory for the time being, or any other your superior officer, according to the rules and discipline of ward. Given at our court at St James the 24th day of October 1786, in the 26th year of our reign, by His Majesty's Command, Sydney. In March 1787, White joined the First Fleet at Plymouth as surgeon for the convict transport ship Charlotte, where he found that the convicts had been living for some time on salt meat, which was a bad preparation for a long voyage. He succeeded in obtaining supplies of fresh meat and vegetables for them. Normally, we would know comparatively little about John White's activities, but Thomas Wilson kept a journal and the first entry on the 5th of March 1787 says, I this day left London charged with dispatches from the Secretary of State's office and from the Admiralty relative to the embarkation of that part of the Marines and convicts intended for Botany Bay, assembled at Plymouth where the Charlotte and Friendship transports were in readiness to receive them. But the next day being ushered in with a very heavy gale of wind, made I impracticable to remove the convicts from on board the Dunkirk prison ship where they were confined. On the evening of the 11th of March, there being little wind, the Charlotte and Friendship were towed out onto the Plymouth Sound and they sailed to Spithead where they arrived on the 17th of March 
anchored and amongst the rest of the transports intended for the same expedition under the conduct of His Majesty's ship, the Sirius. Sir Jim White immediately visited all the other transports and was surprised to find that the general health of the convicts was good. All was ready on the 13th of May 1787, the expedition set sail. On the 2nd of June, the fleet passed the Selvages and the next day they arrived and anchored at Santa Cruz, Tenerife, where fresh provisions and stores were taken on board. They left Tenerife on the 10th of June after calling at Cape de Verde Islands and ran down to the tropics. On the 5th of August, to the intense delight of everyone, the fleet came to an anchor in the harbour of Rio de Janeiro, where fresh provisions soon brought health to the invalids. Surgeon White was delighted with Rio and left it with great regret. On the 4th of September 1787, having been well provided with all kinds of stores and fresh provisions, the fleet left Rio de Janeiro and started on its long and weary passage to the East Ward, at the end of which lay New Holland and Botany Bay, the only break on the way being a call at the Cape of Good Hope. On the 13th of October, the fleet anchored in at Table Bay, but owing to the lack of cordiality on the part of the Dutch governor, had some little difficulty in obtaining fresh provisions and stores. On the 13th of November, they sailed from the Cape on the final part of their long journey. At last, the great voyage was over, and on the 20th of January, they anchored at Botany Bay and caught in their sea net a welcome supply of fresh fish, including brim, mullet and large rays. On the 26th of January, the fleet left Botany Bay and anchored at Port Jackson, and preparations were set for the founding of the new settlement. It was arranged that they should be allowed up on deck to get fresh air. Of almost 1,500 people in the 11 ships of the First Fleet, 778 were convicts, many in poor health from their long imprisonment, and it's to the credit of White and his assistants on the voyage of more than eight months that there were only 34 deaths. On arrival in Australia, White engaged one of the convicts, Thomas Barrett, to engrave a silver medallion to mark the occasion, the medallion known as the Charlotte Medal, is displayed in Australia's National Maritime Museum. In the first days of settlement, there were many hazards for the settlers to contend with. Weak from the long sea voyage, unaccustomed to the heat of the Australian summer, the settlers and the convicts often fell victim to a variety of illnesses. Scurvy, dysentery, sunstroke and snake bites all swept through the early settlement. Lack of accommodation for the sick were his first problems in the new colony. Soon a tent hospital was established in what would later become George Street North. In 1788, White was appointed Surgeon General of New South Wales and organised the first permanent hospital for the new colony on the west side of Sydney Cove, somewhat hampered by a lack of medical supplies. From the History of Sydney Hospital by Dr Frederick Watson on the centenary of laying the foundation stone of the hospital, he said, In the beginning of February 1788, the erection of the first hospital was commenced on the west side of Sydney Cove, near what are now known as the Commiserate Stores, George Street North. It was completed by 12 convict carpenters and 16 hired men from the ships, and as soon as it was finished it was filled, and the overflow occupied tents around it. Some of the drugs were found to have perished during the prolonged voyage, and others were of inferior quality. But it is interesting to read that the native sarsaparilla proved to be a powerfully antiscorbutic and an infusion of wild myrtle astringent for dysentery, the honour of these discoveries being claimed by White. White had on shore his official staff, Assistant Surgeons Balmain, Arndall, Considen, a junior John Irving, and these were to remain as the permanent medical establishment of the new colony. He was a keen amateur naturalist and he found time to accompany Governor Arthur Phillip on two journeys of exploration. Accompanying his journal of a voyage to New South Wales that he sent to England were 65 engravings illustrating the natural history and products of the colony. He also sent drawings and possibly specimens for the voyage of Governor Phillip to Botany Bay, which was published in London in 1789. His own book was a big success. For some reason or another, the previously existing friendly feeling which White entertained for his assistant, William Balmain, changed into an intense dislike, which led to the first duel fought in Australia. John Esty, a Marine of the Scarborough, who kept at this period a most interesting diary, tells us that on the 12th of August 1788, this day the battalion marched from the parade to the flagstaff and fired three volleys. The officers all dined with the governor, 
This night, Mr White, the Surgeon General, and Mr Belmain, the second assistant, fired their pistols at each other and slightly wounded each other. Ill feeling between these men continued for several years. Meanwhile, in the infant colony, it had reached the edge of famine. White helped the erection of a signal station at South Head and was among the officers who volunteered to fish every second night to supplement the rations. In the first years of Australia's settlement, the skill and resourcefulness of Surgeon White helped save many lives. Tea tree leaves were brewed as an anti-scurvy measure, oils were extracted from the eucalypts and also from the native myrtle and peppermint, and wild spinach was correctly identified by White, who advised its use. In April 1789, White treated an Aboriginal boy called Nanbury, who was seriously ill from smallpox. Nanbury recovered after treatment and lived in White's household and was employed by him to shoot small game. White named him Andrew Snape Hammond Douglas White to honour his patron, Captain Sir Andrew Snape Hammond. When Nanbury died in 1821, he was referred to in the Sydney Gazette as Andrew Snape Hammond Douglas White, a black native of this colony. In 1791, the following letter written by John White was published in the Belfast Newsletter. The letter was written in Sydney on the 17th of April 1790 and details the desperate plight of the colony at the time. He could not have foreseen that as he lamented their dire situation, the worst was yet to come. He writes, His Majesty's ship Sirius and Supply Tender sailed from hence on the 6th of March with the Lieutenant Governor, half the Marines and about 200 convicts for Norfolk Island and landed them safe on the 16th. This division of our numbers the Governor thought necessary on account of the low state of our provisions. The ship stood off and on until the 19th before an opportunity of landing the provisions and stores offered. Then the Sirius stood in as close as possible to hasten and facilitate getting the things through a heavy surf, which continually rolls in on the beach, but by a current or some other unforeseen cause she was driven on a reef of hidden rocks and lost. The ship's bow was in a position which will probably make her hold together until everything is got ashore, where the officers and men are safe, with a greater store of provisions than we have here. Had the Sirius arrived safe, she was immediately to be sent to China for some relief for us, and on her despatch all our depended. But alas, that hope is no more, and a new scene of distress and misery opens to our view. When the supply arrived from Norfolk Island with the melancholy tidings, the Governor called all the officers together to consult and deliberate on what was left to be done in our present distracted and deplorable situation. He laid before us the state of the provision store which contained only four months' flour, three months of pork at half allowance, which has been our portion for some time past, and every other species of provision being long since expended. We therefore determined on the necessity of reducing our half allowance of those two articles to such a proportion as it will enable us to drag out a miserable existence for seven months. We have had no arrivals in that time, the game will be up with us for all of the grain of every kind which we have been able to rise in two years and three months would not support us three weeks, which is a very strong instance of ingratitude and extreme poverty of the soil and the country at large, though great exertions have been made. Much cannot now be done, limited in food and reduced as people are. We have not had one ounce of fresh animal food since first in the country, a country in place so forbidden and so hateful as only to merit execrations and curses. For it has been a source of expense to the mother country, and of evil and misfortune to us, without there ever being the smallest likelihood of its repaying or recompensing either. From what we have already seen, we may conclude that there is not a single article in the whole country that in the nature of things could prove of the smallest use or advantage to the mother country or the commercial world. In the name of heaven, what has the ministry been about? Surely they have quite forgotten or neglected us, otherwise they would have sent to see what become of us and to know how we were likely to succeed. However, they must soon know from the heavy bills which will be presented to them and the misfortunes and losses which have already happened to us, how necessary it becomes to relinquish a scheme that in the nature of things can never answer. It would be wise by the first steps to withdraw the settlement, at least such as are living or remove them to some other place. This is so much out of the world and tract of commerce that it could never answer. How a business of this kind, the expense of which must be great, 
could first be thought of without sending to examine the country, as was Captain Thompson's errand to the coast of Africa, as to every person here a matter of great surprise. M. Perouse and Clenard, the French circumnavigators, we well as us, have been very much surprised at Mr Cook's description of Botany Bay. The supply tender ta- sails tomorrow for Batavia in hopes the Dutch may be able to send in time to save us. Should any accident happen to her, Lord have mercy upon us. She is a small vessel to perform so long in an unexplored voyage that we must rely on the abilities and the active attention of Lieutenant Ball who commands her. Lieutenant King, second of the Sirius, takes passage in her to Batavia and from thence to the Cape of Good Hope on his way to Europe, where he has orders to charter a ship and send her to us immediately, should no other ships have passed that place on their way here. The arrival in June 1790 of the Second Fleet tested White and his staff to their utmost. About 500 convicts landed, dying or seriously ill. Despite lack of medicines and hospital accommodation, White and his assistants nursed more than half of them back to health. A portable hospital also arrived with the Second Fleet. In 1790, an epidemic of smallpox swept the colony. In England, the idea of inoculation developed by Edward Jenner had only just begun to gain acceptance. In 1804, John Savage, a friend of Edward Jenner, introduced smallpox vaccination to Sydney. In 1790, John White and Watkin Tench set out in a boat to greet the new arrival into Sydney Cove. She was a Lady Juliana who brought some food but also a cargo of 222 women convicts. On board was Rachel Turner. Rachel Turner was born in about 1760 and she was convicted at Middlesex for grand larceny at the age of 26 on the 12th of December 1787. She was one of the first people ever to be defended in an English court of law. She was defended by Mr Garrow, who claimed that she had not stolen the scarf, but it was in fact given to her by her master, who cheated on his wife to be with her. Despite witnesses, Rachel Turner was given seven years' transportation to Australia. She was held in Newgate Jail until the 14th of March 1789 when she embarked to Australia. And the details of that case being the fact that it was unheard of, Rachel Turner was indicted for feloniously stealing on the 29th day of October 1787 a muslin apron valued at one shilling, a silk border of a gown valued at six shillings, a velvet hood valued at six pence, two small pieces of long lawn valued six pence, nine yards of fine linen valued 19 shillings, a silk handkerchief the value of one shilling, a tablecloth the value of three shillings, a piece of mode, the value of two shillings, a shift, value one shillings, a cloak, value three shillings, an apron, the value of one shilling, four cloths, the value of two shillings, a piece of printed cotton, the value of one shilling, a pair of metal butter boats, value two shillings, one muslin cap, the value of one shilling, all the property of Cleophus Coma. Cleophus Coma sworn, I'm a wax and tallow chandler, the prisoner was a living servant with me between five and six months. I had a good character with her. During the first part of her service, I and my wife thought her to be a worthy and good servant. During my wife's laying in, there were things that went. I suspected the prisoner. There were no other people I could suspect but the nurse. I had a man and boy, but the things were not likely to be taken by a man's servant. I sent for the beadle of St Martin's Parish, William Parsley, and when he came I called the prisoner into the parlour and said, Rachel, I am very sorry I have to speak to you on the subject I am going to do. She says, what is that? I said, I have reason to suspect you are dishonest. She says, what makes you think so? I never took anything that was yours in my life. I said to her, I have reason to think that you have. She said, who has told you anything? I said, it is no matter who has told me anything, I have reason to suspect it, and I am sure you have, and I must insist now on looking into your box, which you seemingly readily complied with. We went to go up the stairs, and the young woman rang to go before, and I called to her, Rachel, stop, let us all go up together. She readily unlocked her box, and the first thing that was presented to view were the two source boats. She was going to take them out. I took the things out of the box and gave them to the officer, My wife owned the things. They were her property. When all the things were taken out of the box, we went down to the dining room. I wrote down on a piece of paper the different articles the girl had taken and then Beadle took them into his possession and the girl to the watch house. 
Mr Garrow said, so this young woman has lived for five or six months in your family home? Yes, was the reply. And she came to you with a very good character? And he said, certainly. You and Rachel were walking arm in arm in Convent Garden together? And he said, I never heard any such thing. The next question was, when you got Rachel into the parlour, did you not say, if you will confess, you shall not be hurt? I never said such a syllable, nor such a word, nor a word like it. Rebecca Comber sworn, I am the wife of the last witness. I lost my property mentioned in the indictment. They were found in Rachel Turner's box. I was present when they were taken out. William Parsley sworn, I am a constable. I searched the prisoner's box. The property is here that is produced. They have been in my custody ever since. The prisoner's defence. My master told me if I knew anything of his property and would confess, he would forgive me. The prisoner called two witnesses who gave her good character. The result was guilty. The court said to the prisoner, the object of which to destroy the domestic peace of your master and mistress, therefore it will be considered in your punishment, transported for seven years and tried at the middle sex jury by Justice Heath. I mentioned earlier about the second fleet and the pressure that it put on food supplies. Well, a similar crisis was experienced when the third fleet arrived between July and September 1791. At one time, about 600 newly arrived convicts were under medical treatment and incapable of work, and in 1792, 436 died. In that same year, Rachel Turner from the Lady Juliana became Dr White's housekeeper. And afterwards, she became his mistress. This resulted in a child that they had together, a boy, Andrew Douglas White, who was baptised in November 1793. Going back to 1792, the strain on White from all those deaths was so severe that in December 1792, he applied for leave in England. However, this was not immediately granted. In the meantime, he pursued natural history studies and he sent many specimens and drawings to England. When Thomas Watling, a convict and artist, reached the colony in October 1792, he was assigned to White and in the next two years made many drawings for him. And it's possible that White himself had some skill as an artist. When Governor Philip departed in 1792 in December, the control of the colony was then passed over to Major Francis Gross, who soon afterwards received permission to make land grants for his officers. In May 1793, White received 100 acres of land, which he called Hammond Hill Farm, afterwards part of the suburb of Petersham. In December 1794, he was granted a further 30 acres adjoining his property, and these grants were eventually transferred to his son, Andrew, who retained those grants until 1822, when they were sold to a settler, Edward Redmond. White's application for leave that went with Governor Philip to England was eventually granted and when he sailed on the Dedalus on the 17th of December 1794, he had the satisfaction of leaving the colony a far healthier place than it had been for five years. Deaths from all causes in his last year had only totaled 59. White remained in contact with Rachel and the child and did provide financial assistance even after her marriage in Sydney in 1796 to Thomas Moore, who was a free ship's carpenter and boat builder. White reached London in July 1795. He did some travelling to Ireland and then early in 1796 he was elected a Fellow of the Linnean Society of London. He was reluctant to return to New South Wales and in August 1796 Faced with the alternative of doing so immediately or resigning his appointment, he chose to resign. He contemplated publishing a second book and he sent a rough manuscript and many drawings to A.B. Lambert, a noted botanist, but the project came to nothing. The manuscript appears to have been lost and the drawings are possibly those which form the so-called Watling Collection that is now preserved in the British Museum of Natural History. On the 29th of February 1796, two years after returning to England, John White married Elizabeth Lysack at St Mary's in the Fields, Westminster. They had three children together, two girls and a boy. For three years, from 1796 to 1799, White served in various ships, including the Royal William. On the 10th of March 1797, the Senate of the University of St Andrews conferred the degree of Doctor of Medicine on him, he was surgeon at Sheerness Navy Yard from December 1799 to September 1803 
and served in that time at the Chatham Yard from September 1803 until he was superannuated in January 1820 at the age of 63. He was granted a half-pay pension of £91.05 and five shillings per year until 1824 and he spent his last years at Brighton. John White's second wife was the widow, Mrs Elizabeth Hope, whom he married in April 1829 at St Nicholas's in Brighton, Sussex. John died at Worthing, England on the 20th of February 1832, aged 75. His burial was recorded a week later at St Mary's Parish Church, Broadwater, and for many years afterwards a small tablet recording the event could be seen at the lower aisle between the choir stalls, and on the stone it's briefly inscribed John White, MD, RN, 1832. According to Reverend Peter Marrow, the rectory at Broadwater, in 1961, the, the tablets seemed to have disappeared at some stage prior. White left an estate at the value of £12,000. His children, Clara Christiana, Richard Hammond and Augusta Catherine Ann, were mentioned in his will. Andrew Douglas White was executor. Clara Christiana's husband, Ralph Bunnell, was also mentioned. So a little more on his children. So his first child, Andrew Douglas White, he was born on the 23rd of September 1793. Andrew was baptised in Sydney on the 3rd of November 1793. And in 1800, at the age of six, he sailed to England aboard the Reliance to join his father, stepmother and half-siblings. Meanwhile, in January 1806, Governor King transferred John White's land grant that was originally given by Major Gross on the 16th of May 1794 to Andrew for a term of 14 years. Andrew was brought up in England and accepted as a member of the White household. He was one of the first students at the Chatham House Boarding School and he graduated as an engineer. Andrew joined the Royal Engineers as a second lieutenant on the 1st of July 1812 he was promoted to first lieutenant on the 21st of July 1813 and went out to Flanders in late 1813 as part of the British force under Lieutenant General Thomas Graham. He remained on the continent in 1814 and served as a junior officer in the Royal Engineer Staff at Waterloo, a surprisingly young group for a branch of service with a reputation of slow promotion. He fought in the Battle of Waterloo and survived unscathed and returned to England to receive his Waterloo Medal in 1816. He stayed in service in France until 1818 and then Andrew returned to Sydney and reunited with his mother late in 1822. He returned to England in July 1824 and was promoted to second captain in the Royal Engineers on the 6th of December 1826 he was placed on half pay on the 6th of October 1831 and then came back to Australia in 1833. On the 18th of June 1835, Andrew married Mary Ann McKenzie at St John's Parramatta, eldest daughter of A.K. McKenzie, a JP, and she was also a niece of Lieutenant Colonel John Piper of the 4th Foot Regiment. Mary Ann had arrived from England via Hobart on the ship the Admiral Cockburn with her parents and her five siblings on the 29th of December 1822. In September 1836, Andrew was appointed a JP in Parramatta. Andrew died on the 24th of November 1837, aged only 44, after a short illness of unknown causes, and there were no children of the marriage. Andrew Douglas White is buried in the Liverpool Pioneer Cemetery. His chest tomb bears the following inscription, Sacred to the memory of Captain A.D. White of the Royal Engineers, who died on the 27th of November, 1837, aged 44 years. No local newspaper lamented the passing of Australia's only Waterloo veteran. Nonetheless, Andrew Douglas White is generally recognised as Australia's first decorated soldier and first returned serviceman. His mother treasured his Waterloo medal until her own death a year later. So a little bit about his mother, Rachel Turner. Well, after Dr. White returned to England, she married Thomas Moore on the 11th of January 1797 at Sydney by Reverend Richard Johnson, and it's registered at St. Philip's Church. Thomas Moore arrived free as a ship's carpenter aboard the ship Britannia in 1791. They did not have any children together. 
Thomas More became a prominent citizen in the colony. He was the master boat builder of the colony in 1795, a position that he held until 1809. They lived on a land grant which had been given beside the tank stream, what has become the southern side of Bridge Street in Sydney. There was a three-acre orchard and it was the centre of his business activities. In 1799, he received a grant of 470 acres at Bullinamming between Petersham and Cooks River. By 1804, he owned 1,100 acres and then by 1807 owned 1,920 acres, mostly pasture land. He was granted land on the Georges River and in 1809 resigned from his position and moved there, building a house that he named Moorbank. Moore accompanied Governor Lachlan Macquarie when he founded the town of Liverpool in 1810 and was appointed to oversee the building of the town, its roads and its convict workforce. Moore was appointed in 1810 as a magistrate for George's River and was reappointed as magistrate for Liverpool each year. In 1821, he became a magistrate for New South Wales. He shared the foundation of the Bank of New South Wales in 1817 and helped to open a savings bank at Liverpool in July 1819. He visited England in 1818 and in 1834 and went to Adelaide in 1839 to arrange the sale and shipment of 2,000 sheep. In the 1814 muster, Rachel Moore is listed as wife to Mr Moore at Liverpool on stores with two children off stores. It is unknown who these two children were. Possibly they could have been foster children to the couple, but there's no records alluding to that. Rachel died on the 13th of November 1838 and is buried at St Luke's Cemetery, Liverpool. The burial register has the notation Rachel Moore, abode Liverpool, buried 16th of November 1838, aged 76, wife of Thomas Moore, Esquire, JP. There's also a memorial to Rachel within St Luke's Church, Liverpool, sculpted by John Adam Pearson. Thomas Moore died on the 24th of December 1840 and there's an obituary outlined in the Australian. Thomas Moore, Esquire JP of Liverpool, died in that town on Thursday last at the advanced age of 83. Mr Moore was the father of magistracy of the colony, having been in the commission of the peace upwards of 40 years. Mr Moore, by industry and frugality, amassed considerable wealth. A great portion of his most valuable landed property consisted of the Moore Bank Estate, containing over 6,000 acres, and his allotments in the town of Liverpool were conveyed by Mr Moore, sometime previous to his death, to the Reverend Dr Broughton, Bishop of Australia, in trust, and the deed expresses it's for the maintenance and support of the bishop and clergymen of the established church. The property is conveyed to be estimated to be worth £20,000. Mr Moore was one of our oldest colonists and much esteemed for his piety and charity. And his tombstone has the inscription... Sacred to the memory of Thomas Moore, Esquire JP, founder of the Moore College and donor of other church benefactions, who died on the 24th of December, 1840. So the Moore Theological College that was founded in 1856 is named after Thomas Moore due to him being the benefactor. And his other three children, Clara Christiana White, she was the second wife of Ralph Banal, who was a, a politician in England, the third child, another son, Richard Hammond White, was a naval lieutenant. And the fourth child, Augusta Catherine Ann White, she married a lieutenant who became a general later on, Henry Sandham R.E. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.